Take your Bible and turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 is uh, the record of the Lord's temptation. That's what we want to talk about tonight. You know, I was thinking about temptation. The Bible says that there is no temptation that is any different from what other people experience. Your temptation is not unique. Uh, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, the Bible says. But I would say this, every person's temptation is within the context, their own context. Uh, That is, you know, you probably can't tempt a billionaire to steal twenty dollars but you could you could very easily uh, tempt a a major stockholder for example to somehow steal power over the stock market so temptations are common to man but they also are within the context of every person. After his baptism, before he begins his public ministry, the Lord Jesus further identifies with us, with the people, and reveals his power in what is called the temptation that we have recorded here in Matthew 4, the first 11 verses actually which uh, we're not going to just sit and and read consecutively tonight, but we'll look at them as we uh, touch upon each of them over the next few minutes. But uh, remember the setting for this. It's not in a pleasant garden setting like Adam and Eve when they were tempted, but he's, he's, he's being ravaged by the elements of a desert, and he is also experiencing gnawing hunger for during this time he will not have eaten for over a month any solid food and uh, thus he's making him very he's making himself very vulnerable to the tempter of course who is Satan and the question is often asked whether Jesus uh, was able to sin or, or whether he was able not to sin Uh, Well, the Bible settles that for us. The Bible says that uh, he was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. And uh, yet it was in the context of who he was. He was the Son of God, who was sent by the Father uh, to save the world from sin. We normally think, when we think of temptation to sin, we normally think of of it in the grossest forms, like maybe sexual impurity or some blatant evil like that. But Jesus' temptation reveals areas of common human temptations and shows us how, as believers, we can have victory over them. And I want to look at them very simply with you. And uh, it deals with the area of living our lives independent of God, of living our lives controlling them ourselves, and then living our lives based upon what we want and making that uh, primary in our thinking. Those are the three types of temptations that the devil brings to Jesus. And I'm telling you, those are the three things that we're always tempted in, those areas, those three ways. To live independent of God, to be in control of our life, and to get what we want. All of those things are inherent in those three temptations. And so, how did Jesus get victory over them? That's the way we can get victory over them as well. And so let's look at that after we, again, pause briefly to pray. Heavenly Father, would you teach us by your Spirit? He is our unction. He himself is our anointing. And we pray for that uh, Spirit of God to teach our hearts tonight what you want us 
to see. Open our eyes, enlighten the eyes of our understanding that we might know. And Lord, may it result in the application here of this truth. It would bring us victory in our lives over temptation to sin, but also that would bring glory to your name, which is the ultimate. We thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. So look at the first temptation. It's in uh, verses 3 and 4 of Matthew chapter 4. And uh, the tempter, Satan, comes to him and he says, If or since you're the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now mind you, he's very hungry, right? Mm -hmm. And Jesus' answer is in verse 4. It is written... Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Here's the temptation, if I can just put it in these terms. The temptation is really that dependence must trump, and I hope you don't mind me using that term, <laughs> Dependence must trump independence. You know what the word trump means? It means it must overcome. It must be on top. So dependence must trump your independence. That's the temptation here. That Jesus would act independent of God that Jesus would act independent of his Father. That he would be independent instead of dependent upon God. Well, folks, we face that temptation every day. And if we're going to have victory in this area, our dependence on God has to trump our independence. Now, interestingly to me, is the Lord's response there in that fourth verse. He makes a biblical defense, does he not? He actually quotes from the book of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 8 and uh, verse 3. And in that, uh, in that chapter, it is the, uh, kind of the, the pep talk, if, if I could uh, use that term, that Moses is giving to the new generation of Israelites that were going to enter into the promised land, the land of Canaan. You'll find this. He quotes scripture. And in fact, in each of the three temptations, Jesus quotes scripture. But here's what I want you to understand that perhaps you haven't before. You've heard it said, perhaps, that uh, the way to have victory over temptation is that you have to have in your arsenal uh, Bible verses that match the, the temptation, and that could be your, your weapon, your armor, to defeat the enemy when he attacks. That's your sword of the Spirit, so to speak. And I, I'm not disputing that, but I think it goes much further than that. That Jesus quotes scripture. He, uh, it, uh, it, it, he is really, it's an explanation of the truth that would be violated if he, if he sunk and uh, fell to that temptation. What sin would he be committing if he yielded to that temptation? He's quoting the scripture, really, not just to give us a defense against uh, Satan's temptation, but to show us the truth that's violated if we give in in this area. If we are independent, we trust ourselves, our independence, instead of being dependent upon God. So this is a crucial reference. This biblical defense is a crucial reference there in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. And here is how it reads. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger, talking about the Israelites in the desert those 40 years. And he fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, 
neither did thy fathers know. In other words, you didn't understand uh, its, uh, its source and its makeup that he might make thee to know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word. Notice, word is in italics, it's not in the original Hebrew. In other words, that he might teach you not only to live by every word of God, by everything that proceeds from the mouth of God. Crucial reference here. The context reveals that the temptation is not merely to put uh, physical things in superiority over spiritual things. That's, that's there, but that's not only what he's... The context reveals is really this. Who are you trusting in your life? Are you trusting yourself or Someone else? Or are you trusting God? We have to learn to live in dependence upon God alone. Dependence trumps your independence. What he's saying there is who you must put your faith in, your dependence upon. And it's God dependence. Everything that proceeds from God, it's God dependence versus self-will, devising your own way and depending upon your own way to get it done or your own way to see your needs met or your own way to have what you need. So here is the vital intelligence that comes out of that, that quote of Deuteronomy 8.3. He says, God allows his people to be humbled. God allows his people's circumstances to be difficult. God allows people, his people's needs to even go unmet at times. He suffered thee to hunger. He allows that to test his people's faith in him and to teach his people that he alone is their source and he alone is their sustainer and of all that you'll ever need. So it's not enough just to have these particular verses in your arsenal uh, in the day of temptation, but you got to understand what these verses are talking about, why he would quote them and then apply that truth in your situation and depend upon God, okay? So the first temptation is a temptation regarding your independence. And the simple truth is this, your dependence on God must trump your independence. Here's the second temptation, and it, uh, we go down to verse five through seven in Matthew four, and here's what we read. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, that's Jerusalem, obviously, and he setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple. And we know that that uh, was that uh, second temple that was there in Jerusalem. And he said to him, and we don't know if this actually uh, was something that was physically done or in a vision, but he said, if thou be the Son of God, Cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give the angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. Let's just stop there a moment. Here's the temptation here. It is this, that surrender to God trumps your sovereignty. Surrender trumps your sovereignty. When Satan quotes scripture, isn't he clever here? He's quoting the Bible. It's like, okay, you want to quote the Bible to me? Deuteronomy 8.3? I'm going to match it. I'm going to quote the Bible to you. And so he quotes Psalm 91. And he quotes Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. I went there and I looked at his quote, and I found a problem with it. 
See if you uh, see a problem with it as I read these verses. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Let me tell you what the devil does. Whenever the devil uses the Bible on us, whenever the devil quotes scripture, you mark it down. It's what is called a pretext. And a pretext is when the Bible is taken out of context and is used to make it say whatever the person wants it to say. That's exactly what Satan is. He's taking the Bible out of its context to make it support the point he wants to make to Jesus. He's tempting Jesus to test the Father to get the Father to do Jesus' will. In other words, he wants Jesus to control his Father so that he can get the Father to do what Jesus wants when he wants it. You see what this temptation is? It's to manipulate God to use his power to accomplish even his purpose in your life, but your way and in your time. You dictate to God. It's a temptation to exercise control over God, even in the area of serving the Lord and doing His work. He quotes this verse as a pretext because when you go back to Psalm 91 as I just did and you read the psalm and see the context you realize that he deliberately misquotes by deleting a certain phrase. You know what that phrase was? In all thy ways. In all thy ways. The key phrase to experience God's protection is that you are going in all of God's ways, not your ways. See? And the irony to me is if you know anything about Psalm 91, and I'm sure Satan knew the context, but that didn't suit his purpose. The context of Psalm 91, it's God's promise of protection to his people who are under satanic attack. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? I remember uh, like it was yesterday, a time when I was under direct satanic attack in my mind, in my thinking. And the only thing that rescued me was Psalm 91. God broke the power of Satan through that passage because he spoke it to my heart and I believed it and I depended upon God based upon what he said in that and the the devil fled I resisted him that way and he fled and then Jesus gives a counter text so Satan throws out a pretext we just checked out the context now Jesus gives a counter text look at it back in Matthew 4 and verse 7, it is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Jesus countered Satan's pretext with a text from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16 in order to oppose Satan's pretext. And you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16 and again it's a warning to this new generation of Israelites that's going to be crossing the Jordan River soon into the land that was that was promised them the land of Canaan and it's a warning don't you do what your parents did don't be like them and he says to them in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and uh, verse 16 well let me remind you, before I even look at that quote from, uh, from Jesus in, in that passage, let me remind you, Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4 is what? It's the 
the motto, if I could use that terminology, of Judaism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. It's the Shema in 6.4. And then in verse 7, he begins to build on that, and uh, he says that you should love the Lord your God with your whole being, right? You should love him uh, with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Talks about the uh, putting God's word uh, uh, between your eyes, and that's the basis for the Orthodox having the, the, uh, the phylacteries. And then uh, putting God's word on your gates and the doors of your house, and that's the Orthodox using the mezuzah. They get it from that. And then in verse 16, he says, uh, Honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. That, uh, that's not it. That's chapter 5. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Massa. That is, as your parents tempted him when they were complaining that they wanted water now. So what, what's he, why, why is he quoting this verse? He's warning this generation, don't try to control God to get what you want. Don't try to control God. Don't try to get God to use his power to supply what you want when you want it. Are you surrendering to God? Are you trying to manipulate and use God as you need him? See, this is the temptation here. And it is simply this. The victory over it is that surrender to God must trump your sovereignty. You're not in control. He is. You have to surrender to his control. And then the third temptation, getting back to Matthew 4, if you'll look uh, this time in, in verses 8 to 10, again, the devil take them up into an exceeding high mountain and show them all the kingdoms of the world, all the glory of them. And he saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. And he said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the, uh, the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Here's the third and final thing. This is in the area of our wants, what we desire. And worship of God trumps your wants. Worship trumps your wants. You see, here's what Satan wants. Satan desires one thing. His main goal is not to send as many people to hell as he can send. Whoever said that doesn't understand the mind of Satan. Not that I do. But the Bible makes it very clear that Satan's goal, one goal, is that he would be worshipped. He wants to be his God. Isaiah 14, verse 14, I will be like the Most High. I want worship. I want to replace God and be the recipient of the worship that only belongs to him. That's Satan's desire, to be worshipped, to be the object of all worship. And to do so, he seduces people from worshipping the living God who made us for himself by alluring through our personal desires the glitzy world. So that all of our Facebook posts are about worldly things and about ourselves. So all we think about is our outward appearance mainly and external things. Satan desires to be worshipped and so he deludes and in this ninth verse of, of uh, Matthew 4 he says, all you got to do is fall down and worship me and you're going to reach your goal. And your goal is all the kingdoms of the world, right? You want to be king of the earth, right? Well, here's a shortcut. Here's a way to get it without the suffering of the cross. To seduce us, 
he deludes us, doesn't he? He deludes us to sacrifice the eternal for the temporal by tempting us to fulfill even God's purpose for our lives at the expense of truth by tolerating compromise or by uh, saying that we're believers but we walk by sight and not by faith just like the world does. Our worship has to trump our wants. Satan desires worship. He deludes in order to get it even from Jesus. But I'm telling you, the quote that Jesus offers there in that 10th verse or, uh, is, is really Satan's defeat. And he's quoting from, again, Deuteronomy chapter 6. But this time, he's quoting from verse 13, where, again, this same group, Jesus is warning them. He, say, he said in that 6th chapter, Love me. Love God with all of your being. And, and that's important because when you get into that new land, listen, when you get into, the Lord brings you into that land which he promised you, and you have goodly cities which you didn't build, houses full of good things which you didn't fill, wells full of water that you didn't dig, vineyards and olive trees which you didn't plant, and you are eating and you are full you have all and more beware verse 12 beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and swear by his name here is what he's saying in order to worship have worship trump your wants you got to love the giver more than his gifts that's what he's saying here that's why he quotes this verse that all the blessings in the promised land don't forget that's not what you're supposed to love you're supposed to love the Lord your God with your whole being what's most important in life not things but God a personal, loving relationship with Him. That's what makes life really complete. That's what totally satisfies in life. And that's what's missing from most people's lives in this world, including some Christians. Because they have made their wants more important than worship. I want to read a quote from a book on worship that has blessed my heart uh, uh, for quite a while. But this is a quote from A.W. Tozer and here's what he said that man was made to worship God. God gave to man a harp and said here above all creatures that I have made and created I have given you the largest harp. I put more strings on your instrument and I have given you a wider range than I have given to any other creature. You can worship me in a manner that no other creature can. And when he sinned, man took that instrument and he threw it down in the mud. And there it, lain for, there it has lain for centuries, rusted, broken, unstrung. And man instead of playing a harp like the angels and seeking to worship God in all of his activities is ego-centered and turns in on himself and sulks and swears and laughs and sings but it's all without joy and without worship worship is the missing jewel in modern evangelicalism we're organized we work we have our agendas we have almost everything but there's one thing that the churches, even gospel churches, do not have. That is the ability to worship. We are not cultivating the art of worship. It's the one shining gem that is lost to the modern church. And I believe that we ought to search for it until we find it. When worship 
trumps your wants, God's glorified. When your, sur uh, your surrender trumps your sovereignty, God's glorified. And when your dependence upon God trumps your independence from God, you've won victory over a major temptation and over the tempter in your life. So our Heavenly Father, we pray that you just cause us to think on these things and let them bring great uh, change in our hearts as a result of it. I pray that our hearts would be deeply moved and touched as we think about our need to surrender to you and uh, to worship you and to depend upon you. May that really characterize our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we close...